This ingredient, which makes up 12% of venom, causes pain and inflammation. Filled circle 9% of bee venom consists of histamine. Histamine causes tiny capillaries to leak fluid. This is why bee stings cause itchy red spots. Histamine also contributes to some of the pain of the sting. Filled circle some ingredients help to strengthen the toxicity of the venom. Apamin, which makes up 3% of venom, destroys nerve tissue. Hyaluronidase 2% of venom, helps the reaction to spread to surrounding tissue by breaking down one of the components of cell tissue. Filled circle only female insects can sting. The structure of this modified ovipositor allows the sting to act like a self-guided missile. Filled circle the bee doesn't need much force to embed the sting into its victim. The barbs are positioned on the sting in a way that helps pull it further into the wound. Filled circle attached to the sting is the bee's venom sac, containing melatonin, histamine and other proteins. Filled circle when a bee stings, venom is released into a space on the sting between the barbs and the stylet. Filled circle honeybees won't sting unless they sense a threat, because they can't withdraw their stings. Once they sting, they die. The venom sac and sting of the bee are torn from the abdomen and left behind. Filled circle even when the sting is no longer a part of the bee, it can keep pumping venom into a victim. That's why getting the sting out quickly after a sting is important. Filled circle when a bee stings, an alarm pheromone is released by its Koshevnikov gland. Located near the sting shaft of the worker bee, this gland is responsible for most of the bee's alarm pheromones. Filled circle when worker bees detect this alarm pheromone blend, they fly faster and buzz more. It signals the defenders, aka stingers, to seek and sting threats. Filled circle the alarm pheromones of honeybees contain about 20 compounds. Of these, isopentyl acetate is the key compound. Swarm intelligence and its application. Filled circle as honeybees cluster into a hanging hive, they begin to behave like a single superorganism that can detect and respond to sheer forces in a way that would not be possible for any one individual bee. Filled circle when the population exceeds, a queen bee leaves the existing hive along with about half the worker bees. The queen then finds a temporary location for the bees to congregate. Filled circle when she lands there, her pheromones signal to the swarm of worker bees, sometimes upwards of 10,000 of them, and they soon join her, aggregating into a bulbous inverted hanging cone. Filled circle there is no external architecture providing support. All that keeps them together is a collective grasp, a small number of bees directly hold onto the branch and the remaining bees hold onto either those bees or each other. Filled circle this temporary home can last anywhere from a few hours to several days as scouts search for a permanent nest site. Filled circle in response to fluctuations in temperature, the colony is able to maintain a near-constant core temperature by adjusting its surface area to volume ratio, and in the event of high temperatures the colony will even form channels that are believed to promote air circulation. Filled circle should it rain, the bees on the outside work together to form shingles that encourage water runoff, keeping moisture away from the interior. Filled circle if a high wind or a predator shakes the branch, the bees seem to be able to work together to mitigate this, too. Filled circle bees conduct side-to-side -side shaking along a gradient, moving from where the stress was lowest, at the bottom of the colony toward where the stress was greatest, the top of the colony even though for some bees, that meant taking on more stress than they'd had at the outset. Filled circle for those individuals, it was essentially a form of altruistic behavior. This instinct to do what's best for the group seems to enable the bees to function as a superorganism. Parasitic hymenopterans. Filled circle hymenopteran parasites form 50% of all insect parasites. They belong to Eichneumonidae ad Chalcididae. Most of them are entomophagous parasites. There are different types of parasitism. 1. Hyperparasitism. Parasite of a parasite. Hyperparasite is a secondary parasite. E.g., Ernestia is parasitized by Chalcid larva. Aphid has an Eichneumonid primary parasite and a Chalcid secondary parasite. Hyperparasites reduce or modify the efficiency of primary parasite. 2. Multiparasitism. When two or more Hymenoptera lay eggs on the same host. Both parasites lay eggs almost at the same time or in the same developmental stage. E.g., the fully grown caterpillar Monma flavicens is first parasitized by the Chalcid Uratoma Monmae by drilling hole in the cocoon using ovipositor and laying eggs. It is followed by another Chalcid Chrysis shanghaiensis. 3. Superparasitism. When large number of parasites of a species develop and are on the same host. Usually it involves polyembryony. E.g., Chalcid species like Macrocentris lays a single egg in the Lepidopteran caterpillar. About 500 embryos develop in the hemocoal of the caterpillar and sometimes 3,000 individuals emerge from the caterpillar. 4. Autoparasitism. Chalcid and Carisa formosa females develop on the white fly and males develop in the larval females of the same species. 5. Social parasitism. It is the encroachment of the nest of one species by another species. Cuckoo bees have no workers and pollen collecting apparatus. But they have thick cuticle, strong mandibles and sharper sting. The females enter a bombus colony. The workers of the colony try to drive away the intruder but as it is stronger, it cannot be driven away. Either the bombus queen is killed or they may live side by side. The larvae of the bombus queen are often eaten by the cuckoo bees. Also they feed on the nectar and pollen collected by the bombus workers. Slave making dulosis and formica sanguinea makes slave from F. fusca. Queen of F. sanguinea steals offsprings of F. fusca. Fusca workers attend the parasite's brood. Fusca colony is outnumbered by sanguinea. When fusca workers are insufficient sanguinea workers compel the fusca workers to raid other fusca colonies and carry the larvae and pupae to the master's nest. These larvae also work for sanguinea. Three to four raids are carried out in a year. 6. Inquilinism. It is akin to commensalism where the inquiline usually seeks shelter from the host. E.g., gall wasp Synergus umbraculus and S. reinhardi or inquilines of the gall maker Andricus cholerae. 7. Kleptoparasitism. Similar to inquilinism but parasite steals the food of the host or ovipositing site and host is killed by the parasite. Economic importance of parasitic hymentera. Filled circle Hymenoptera parasitica represent the richest group of Hymenoptera and insects.
Chalcidism. Chalcid and Carisa formosa females develop on the white fly and males develop in the larval females of the same species. 5. Social parasitism. It is the encroachment of the nest of one species by another species. Cuckoo bees have no workers and pollen collecting apparatus. But they have thick cuticle, strong mandibles and sharper sting. The females enter a bombus colony. The workers of the colony try to drive away the intruder but as it is stronger, it cannot be driven away. Either the bombus queen is killed or they may live side by side. The larvae of the bombus queen are often eaten by the cuckoo bees. Also they feed on the nectar and pollen collected by the bombus workers. Slave making dulosis and formica sanguinea makes slave from F. fusca. Queen of F. sanguinea steals offsprings of F. fusca. Fusca workers attend the parasite's brood. Fusca colony is outnumbered by sanguinea. When fusca workers are insufficient sanguinea workers compel the fusca workers to raid other fusca colonies and carry the larvae and pupae to the master's nest. These larvae also work for sanguinea. Three to four raids are carried out in a year. 6. Inquilinism. It is a kind of commensalism where the inquiline usually seeks shelter from the host. E.g., gall wasps Synergus umbraculus and S. reinhardi or inquilines of the gall maker Andricus cholerae. 7. Kleptoparasitism. Similar to inquilinism but parasite steals the food of the host or ovipositing site and host is killed by the parasite. Economic importance of parasitic hymenterra. Filled circle hymenoptera parasitica represent the richest group of hymenoptera and insect species that develop as parasitoids of many insects, playing an important role in regulating pest populations. Filled circle they can lay their eggs on or directly within their host which dies due to the development of the larva that feeds on it. Filled circle the large number of hymenoptera parasitica combined with their ability to respond to the density of the populations of its hosts makes them essential to maintain ecological balance. Filled circle in most terrestrial ecosystems, hymenoptera parasitica are, key species. Filled circle its removal can cause the, cascading effect, in the host population. Filled circle whereas the decrease in the host population leads to the decrease in parasitoid populations, as they compete with each other and decrease in number. Filled circle parasitic hymenoptera has a role in IPM programs. E.g., Eichneumonidae develop on largest pests mainly larvae of moths and beetles Aphidiaenae, which specialize in the parasitization of aphids. A very large group of Chalcidoidea is represented in the orchard biocenosis. Egg. Filled. Bee venom. Bee venom, apotoxin, is an important weapon that honeybees use for self-defense, and is produced in poison glands in the abdominal cavity. Approximately 0.3 mg bee venom is produced in the venom sac. Bees inject the poison with their stings, although male bees do not possess these. The substance is yellowish, bitter, pungent, and normally liquid. This valuable mixture contains at least 60 identifiable components. Bee venom has a very complex chemical structure consisting of various enzymes, proteins and peptides. Bee venom mainly consists of melatonin, apamin, MCD peptide, histamine, hyaluronidase, and phospholipase A2. It has also been reported to possess many biological active properties in humans including the immune system, central and peripheral nervous system, and cardiovascular system, antibacterial, fungicide, antiviral, anti-inflammatory, antiarthritis, antitumoral, and antineurodegenerative effects, and potential for use in acupuncture and homeopathy. Bee venom is currently the most the important agent in apotherapy. Honeybee venom can be collected in two different ways, surgical and electroshock methods. In surgical collection, bee venom is obtained from the venom gland by squeezing each individual bee until a droplet emerges from the sting. This method is very difficult and time-consuming, and is little use today. The electroshock method employs a cooling system with a standard electroshock collecting apparatus in order to preserve more of the volatile compounds. Various different electrical collecting techniques are available. This technique makes it possible to obtain a much higher quantity of bee poison at one time, 130. Electrically equipped glass trays are placed in front of the beehives. Following the application of a low ampere electroshock, the bees deposit their poisons on the tray. The bee venom then comes into contact with the air, and quickly dries and crystallizes. The amorphous bee venom, also known as raw venom, is a dirty yellow in color, and is either crystallized or directly stored in deep freezes. Studies have also demonstrated that bee venom is an allergen agent also responsible for allergic disorders, such as asthma, allergic rhinoconjunctivitis, and atopic eczema, through the generation of allergen-specific CD4 plus T cells 131. In some cases, bee sting leads to an increase in specific immunoglobulins Ig interleukin-4, IL-4, and IL-13, specific cytokines, by overstimulating the immune system, frequently resulting in death. Honeybee venom consists of numerous enzymes, peptides, and proteins, a variety of smaller molecules, amino acids, catecholamines, sugars, and minerals, and lipids, although the main components are proteins and peptides. The main peptides and proteins are melatonin, apamin, MCD peptide, secapine, pamin, minamine, adolapine, procamine A, B, protease inhibitor, tertiapine, cardiopep, and melatonin F. The main enzymes identified to date in bee venom are phospholipase A2, phospholipase B, hyaluronidase, phosphatase, alpha-glucosidase, lysophospholipase, and acid phosphomonoesterase. Histamine, dopamine, noradrenaline and aminobutyric acid are some of the identified biogenic amines in bee venoms. Glucose and fructose are the main sugars and P, CA and Mg the main minerals 4129. Some pheromones of isopentyl acetate, n-butyl acetate, isopentanol, n-hexyl acetate, n-octyl acetate, 2-nonanol, n-desyl acetate, benzyl acetate, benzyl alcohol, 2-11-eicosen-10l are also present in bee venom 133. Bee venom has also been used as a supportive therapy in recent years, especially for rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, cancer, and shingles.
The main pharmacological component of bee venom, constituting approximately 50% of its dry matter, is melatonin. This water-soluble protein consists of 26 amino acids with a molecular weight of 2,840 daltons. Many studies have reported that melatonin is a very active peptide exhibiting antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, antitumoral and antiparasitic activities. The proposed activity ion of melatonin has been attributed to its non-selective cytolytic peptide structure, which physically and chemically disrupts all prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell membranes 133 figure 7.7. Melatonin has also been shown to exhibit a variety of anti-cancer effects, either in preclinical cell culture or animal model systems, 133, including lung cancer cells A549 and NCIH460. Ovarian cancer cells. Angiogenesis of human hepatocellular carcinoma Bell 7402. Prostate cancer cells and liver cancer cells. B venom and melatonin are of significant potential in the treatment of autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus erythematosus, and multiple sclerosis, and some neurodegenerative diseases, including Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's disease and ALS. Production of honey. Honey is produced by bees collecting nectar and honeydew for use as sugars consumed to support metabolism of muscle activity during foraging or to be stored as a long-term food supply. 1314. During foraging, bees use part of the nectar collected to support metabolic activity of flight muscles, with the majority of collected nectar destined for regurgitation, digestion, and storage as honey. 1315. In cold weather or when other food sources are scarce, adult and larval bees use stored honey as food. 14. By contriving for honeybee swarms to nest in human-made hives, people have been able to semi-domesticate the insects and harvest excess honey. In the hive or in a wild nest, the three types of bees are a single female queen bee. A seasonally variable number of male drone bees to fertilize new queens. 20,000 to 40,000 female worker bees, 16. Leaving the hive, a foraging bee collects sugar-rich flower nectar, sucking it through its proboscis and placing it in its proventriculus, honey stomach or crop, which lies just dorsal to its food stomach. In Apis mellifera, the honey stomach holds about 40 milligrams of nectar, or roughly 50% of the bee's unloaded weight, which can require over a thousand flowers and more than an hour to fill. The nectar generally begins with a water content of 70 to 80%. 17. Salivary enzymes and proteins from the bee's hypopharyngeal gland are added to the nectar to begin breaking down the sugars, raising the water content slightly. The forager bees then return to the hive, where they regurgitate and transfer nectar to the hive bees. The hive bees then use their honey stomachs to ingest and regurgitate the nectar, forming bubbles between their mandibles repeatedly until it is partially digested. The bubbles create a large surface area per volume and a portion of the water is removed through evaporation. 13, 15, 18, 19. The bees' digestive enzymes hydrolyze converts sucrose to a mixture of glucose and fructose, and break down other starches and proteins, increasing the acidity. 13, 15, 20. The bees work together as a group with the regurgitation and digestion for as long as 20 minutes, passing the nectar from one bee to the next, until the product reaches the honeycombs in storage quality. 1-5. It is then placed in honeycomb cells and left unsealed while still high in water content, about 50 to 70 percent, and natural yeast switch, unchecked, would cause the sugars in the newly formed honey to ferment. 14-21-22. Bees are among the few insects that can generate large amounts of body heat, and the hive bees constantly regulate the hive temperature, either heating with their bodies or cooling with water evaporation, to maintain a fairly constant temperature of about 35 degrees Celsius 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the honey storage areas. The process continues as hive bees flutter their wings constantly to circulate air and evaporate water from the honey to a content around 18%, raising the sugar concentration beyond the saturation point and preventing fermentation. 14-15. The bees then cap the cells with wax to seal them. 1-5. As removed from the hive by a beekeeper, honey has a long shelf life and will not ferment if properly sealed. 14. Some wasp species, such as Brachygaster lecaguana and Brachygaster mellifica found in South and Central America, are known to feed on nectar and produce honey. 23. Some wasps, such as Polistes versicolor, consume honey, alternating between feeding on pollen in the middle of their life cycles and feeding on honey, which can better provide for their energy needs. 24. Production. Collection. Honey is collected from wild bee colonies or from domesticated beehives. On average, a hive will produce about 29 kilograms, 65 pounds, of honey per year. 25. Wild bee nests are sometimes located by following a honey guide bird. To safely collect honey from a hive, beekeepers typically pacify the bees using a bee smoker. The smoke triggers a feeding instinct and attempt to save the resources of the hive from a possible fire, making them less aggressive, and obscures the pheromones the bees use to communicate. The honeycomb is removed from the hive and the honey may be extracted from it either by crushing or by using a honey extractor. The honey is then usually filtered to remove beeswax and other debris. Before the invention of removable frames, bee colonies were often sacrificed to conduct the harvest. The harvester would take all the available honey and replace the entire colony the next spring. Since the invention of removable frames, the principles of husbandry led most beekeepers to ensure that their bees have enough stores to survive the winter, either by leaving some honey in the beehive or by providing the colony with a honey substitute such as sugar water or crystalline sugar, often in the form of a candy board. The amount of food necessary to survive the winter depends on the variety of bees and on the length and severity of local winters. Many animal species are attracted to wilder domestic sources of honey. Preservation Because of its composition and chemical properties, honey is suitable for long-term storage, and is easily assimilated even after long preservation. Honey, and objects immersed in honey, have been preserved for centuries. The key to preservation is limiting access to humidity. In its cured state, honey has a sufficiently high sugar content to inhibit fermentation. If exposed to moist air, its hydrophilic properties pull moisture into the honey, eventually diluting it to the point that fermentation can begin. The long shelf life of honey is attributed to an enzyme found in the stomach of bees. 
The bees mix glucose oxidase with expelled nectar they previously consumed, creating two byproducts, gluconic acid and hydrogen peroxide, which are partially responsible for honey acidity and suppression of bacterial growth. Adulteration Honey is sometimes adulterated by the addition of other sugars, syrups, or compounds to change its flavor or viscosity, reduce cost, or increase the fructose content to stave off crystallization. Adulteration of honey has been practiced since ancient times, when honey was sometimes blended with plant syrups such as maple, birch, or sorghum and sold to customers as pure honey. Sometimes crystallized honey was mixed with flour or other fillers, hiding the adulteration from buyers until the honey was liquefied. In modern times the most common adulterant became clear, almost flavorless corn syrup, the adulterated mixture can be very difficult to distinguish from pure honey. According to the Codex Alimentarius of the United Nations, any product labeled as, honey, or, pure honey, must be a wholly natural product, although labeling laws differ between countries. In the United States, according to the National Honey Board NHB, supervised by the United States Department of Agriculture, honey stipulates a pure product that does not allow for the addition of any other substance. This includes, but is not limited to, water or other sweeteners. Isotope ratio mass spectrometry can be used to detect addition of corn syrup and cane sugar by the carbon isotopic signature. Addition of sugars originating from corn or sugar cane C4 plants, unlike the plants used by bees, and also sugar beet, which are predominantly C3 plants, skews the isotopic ratio of sugars present in honey, but does not influence the isotopic ratio of proteins. In an unadulterated honey, the carbon isotopic ratios of sugars and proteins should match. Levels as low as 7% of addition can be detected. Respiration in aquatic insects. Aquatic insects need oxygen too. They are equipped with a variety of adaptations that allow them to carry a supply of oxygen with them underwater or to acquire it directly from their environment. Cuticular respiration. Many aquatic species have a relatively thin integument that is permeable to oxygen and carbon dioxide. Diffusion of gases through this body while cuticular respiration may be sufficient to meet the metabolic demands of small, and active insects especially those living in cold, fast-moving streams where there is plenty of dissolved oxygen. Larger insects, more active ones, or those living in less oxygenated water may need to rely on other adaptations to supplement cuticular respiration. Biological gills. A biological gill is an organ that allows dissolved oxygen from the water to pass by diffusion into an organism's body. In insects, gills are usually outgrowths of the tracheal system. They are covered by a thin layer of cuticle that is permeable to both oxygen and carbon dioxide. In mayflies and damselflies, the gills are leaf-like in shape and located on the sides or rear of the abdomen. Fanning movements of the gills keep them in contact with a constant supply of fresh water. Stoneflies and caddisflies have filamentous gills on the thorax or abdomen. Dragonflies differ from other aquatic insects by having internal gills associated with the rectum. Water is circulated in and out of the anus by muscular contractions of the abdomen. This rectal gill mechanism doubles as a jet propulsion system. A sudden, powerful contraction of the abdomen will expel a jet of water and thrust the insect forward a quick way to escape from predators. Breathing tubes. Although many aquatic insects live underwater, they get air straight from the surface through hollow breathing tubes, sometimes called siphons, that work on the same principle as a diver's snorkel. In mosquito larvae, for example, the siphon tube is an extension of the posterior spiracles. An opening at the end of the siphon is guarded by a ring of closely spaced hairs with a waterproof coating. At the airwater interface, these hairs break the surface tension of the water and maintain an open airway. When the insect dives, water pressure pushes the hairs close together so they seal off the opening and keep water out. Water scorpions hemiptera, nepody, and rat-tailed maggots larvae of a syrphid fly are two more examples of aquatic insects that have snorkel-like breathing tubes. Many aquatic plants maintain their buoyancy by storing oxygen, a waste product of photosynthesis, in special vacuoles. A few insects, e.g. larva of Mansonia spp. Mosquitoes insert their breathing tubes into these air stores and obtain a rich supply of oxygen without ever swimming to the surface of the water. Air bubbles. Some aquatic insects diving beetles, for example carry a bubble of air with them whenever they dive beneath the water surface. This bubble may be held under the elytra, wing covers, or it may be trapped against the body by specialized hairs. The bubble usually covers one or more spiracles so the insect can breathe air from the bubble while submerged. An air bubble provides an insect with only a short-term supply of oxygen, but thanks to its unique physical properties, a bubble will also collect some of the oxygen molecules dissolved in the surrounding water. In effect, the bubble acts as a physical gill, replenishing its supply of oxygen through the physics of passive diffusion. The larger the surface area of the bubble, the more efficiently this system works. An insect can remain underwater as long as the volume of oxygen diffusing into the bubble is greater than or equal to the volume of oxygen consumed by the insect. Unfortunately, the size of the bubble shrinks over time as nitrogen slowly diffuses out into the water. When the bubble's surface area decreases, its rate of gas exchange also decreases. Eventually, the bubble becomes too small to keep up with metabolic demands and the insect must renew the entire bubble by returning to the water surface. Plastrons A plastron is a special array of rigid, closely spaced hydrophobic hairs cetate, that create an airspace next to the body. Air trapped within a plastron operates as a physical gill just like air in a bubble, but this airspace cannot shrink in volume because the fortress of cetate prevents encroachment of surrounding water. When the insect consumes oxygen, it creates a partial pressure deficit inside the plastron. This deficit is corrected by dissolved oxygen that diffuses in from the water. As nitrogen gradually diffuses out of the bubble, it creates a similar partial pressure deficit. But there is very little dissolved nitrogen present in water, it has a lower solubility potential than oxygen, so some of the nitrogen's partial pressure deficit is corrected by oxygen. In effect, the plastron trades some of the nitrogen for oxygen keeping a constant volume of gas that may slowly become enriched with oxygen. The constant volume of a plastron's air supply eliminates the periodic need to surface and replenish the bubble. 
insects that remain permanently submerged x riffle beetles family elmidae or lack the ability to reach the surface x eggs of floodwater mosquitoes are likely to have plastrons these structures are often visible underwater as thin silvery films of air covering parts of the body surface hemoglobin hemoglobin is a respiratory pigment that facilitates the capture of oxygen molecules it is an essential component of all human red blood cells, but it occurs only rarely in insects most notably in the larvae of certain midges family Chironomidae, known as bloodworms. These distinctive red, worms, usually live in the muddy depths of ponds or streams where dissolved oxygen may be in short supply. Under normal aerobic conditions, hemoglobin molecules in the blood bind and hold a reserve supply of oxygen. Whenever conditions become anaerobic, the oxygen is slowly released by the hemoglobin for use by the cells and tissues of the body. This backup supply may only last a few minutes, but it's usually long enough for the insect to move into more oxygenated water. Respiration in aquatic insects 